Well, thank you. And yeah, this is this is my this is my first visit to Georgia, and hard to believe. Um, although I have to say, uh, it was not cold this morning. <laughs> But I do definitely welcome any opportunity in December to travel south, and that goes for January, February, March, and April, and October and November as well. So, so thank you. No, this, is really, this is really great. What a great event, and I am so impressed at what, um, what Georgia is doing, what you're all doing. Um, I'd like to congratulate the award winners this morning. That's pretty amazing. Um, uh, it takes a lot of time and energy and focus and the things that we as faculty don't really have a lot of, uh, to, to be innovators like that and step out and uh, get some things done. Um, so kudos to you. Um, so what I'd like to do today is um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a different perspective. In fact, it's quite different because of my role. So I am a graduate faculty, and I'm also the chief information officer in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. And that title always takes me about three breaths to say. But, uh, and, and so um, I have a, a, a different perspective in how I've engaged with this conversation of open and that I'm I'm faculty, but I'm also, my job is as chief information officer, I oversee staff who day to day are with faculty, working with them, trying to help them with uh, generally, uh, it, it tends to be educational technology work, instructional designers, academic technologists, but they also engage in this open work as well. And um, so what I'd like to do today is give more of a kind of a, a ground game look at how we've engaged. And you've heard a lot of very inspiring people who inspire me. Um, you've heard you know, David Wiley and Cable and David Harris and Nicole. And, um, and, and so this is gonna be a little bit different. And if it's not inspiring, a keynote, you know, you want it to really be inspiring? Please excuse that. And I'll give you even another reason to excuse it. It's my birthday today. So, so, oh, so if this goes horribly, just remember, it's my birthday today, okay? <laughs> so I, I like to start with, um, uh, it, it's very similar to what kind of Cable started with yesterday, saying, let's just remember what this is all about. And, um, you, you know, I, is it okay if I show family photos for a while? Is that okay? Um, this is my, I have three boys. This is my second uh, of three, uh, Justin. Uh, this is at his graduation. He's a, he, was, uh, he graduated from St. Paul uh, Central High School this last spring. And we drove him up this fall to uh, the University of Minnesota Duluth. And uh, he's, it's, it's close, but far enough away that he's happy. And, uh, and, you know, nothing means more to me in the world than my boys. And as I think about the students uh, that we work with every day. I, I am now, since I have college age sons, it's much more personal. And um, I also have a junior at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I also have a senior in high school. Um, so can we get this affordability thing figured out pretty quick? Because, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, and Justin, um, as I think about what I really want from him as we drop him off, you know, what do we really want for him, excuse me, not from him, um, you know, I, I want, you know, when it comes to education, I think of it in, in, in kind of with kind of three legs. Um, personal growth. I want him to become a, a, a more uh, well-rounded person, right? So personal growth is one. Um, I want him to, you know, I want him to understand himself better. I want him to understand the world better, and I want him to understand his place in that world. Um, Number two it would be, um, you know, we need an educated citizenry and we, we for, a, for a healthy democracy, we all know that. And, and number three is the one that probably gets, in my opinion, gets focused on too much, it's important, which is, um, some would say gainfully employed or um, uh, I, I would say he, he is fulfilling, he is a productive member of society, right? And I want that for him too. And so I'm going to cut to the chase here and skip a whole bunch of steps that I might normally you know, dwell on 
to talk about the fact that I really believe that open, I don't think you need to, I hope you don't need to hear any more. If you've heard it from David and Cable and so on, um, I'm not going to go into that. Let's just say that I believe it, that, that open is um, the direction. And my path down that road to improving education through open is, um, I, I started down that road just over three years ago. I went to a conference and Nicole Allen was at it, and she loves when I tell the story. And um, I had been looking at open um, and open textbooks and how I could help my faculty with that. And went to a presentation, the Sloan Conference down here in, in Florida. And um, she presented on open textbooks, did an excellent job. And I kind of cornered her in the hallway afterwards. And I said, OK, um, you know, if, if they're so good, and I believe they are, what's the deal? Why aren't my, any faculty that I know using open textbooks? What are the barriers? And I thought I had her cornered, of course. But if anyone, if you know Nicole, it's not really possible. She always has the answer. And so that, this is the question I, was ask, I asked her. And this is the question that um, I've been asking for three years and trying to find solutions to. And just, again, really on the ground, working with faculty, working with administrators. What Nicole told me that day was it was instant, first of all. She was like, well, here's what we need. We need, first of all, she said, faculty don't know where to find them, and they don't the open textbooks, and they don't know if they're any good. Said, oh, OK. And she immediately then answered a question I didn't ask, which was, uh, what do we do about it? What's the solution? And she said, what we need is a research institution to host a catalog of open textbooks that are peer-reviewed. Peer and I don't even know if she knew where I was from. I think my name tag might have been turned around, but I'm from the University of Minnesota, which is a research one institution. And, and um, I think the point she was making there is we need a, a, a place that academia, you know, to be as credible as possible, our ones are that, whether they should be or not, they are. And so I went back and talked to my dean and worked through this and decided, OK, maybe this will help my faculty move forward. And if it helps everyone else, Great, we'll put, a, let's put this thing on the web. So we scoured the web, so the, the web looking for these things, these open textbooks, basically trying to do the work that faculty would normally do, right? Put a lot of time and energy in those things that faculty don't have um, into finding things they need. And we put together this, and there's the URL on the bottom. It's, it's there, and you're welcome to use it, and we're making improvements to it all the time, rolling out a new version here in January. But it's, it's there, and it's very simple and easy. Um, so after I did that, went back to my faculty, pointed them to it, and going, okay, maybe this will do it. So can you want to guess how many adoptions we got from this action? Okay, so oh, I needed to keep asking questions. What I understood, what I learned pretty quickly is there were some things that faculty don't needed to understand a little bit better. Um, in fact, I'm still learning about open. Open isn't a, an issue, or it's not a, it's not a concept that's, that's understood in the, the mainstream of society. And so what we decided to do was um, put together a workshop and invite faculty to it. So now that it's easy for them to find them. Um, we'll talk about the peer review part here in a minute. But let's just sit them down and talk to them about some things and educate them. So I'm going to show you what we now, we now have given this workshop, oh, I don't even know how many times, uh, a few dozen times probably. And tweaked it and tweaked it and tweaked it as we've learned, as we've gone along. And I'm going to kind of show you what we've, it's, it's, it's one approach. It's not the only approach certainly, but I'm going to tell you what we've learned from it. Um, so first of all, I, oh, I forgot to cite this, but I would have put David Wiley this morning. Um, and and um, that I do definitely believe that open the, is more than just free. And the important parts of open are also the permissions and the innovations that you can build from that. I am, however, going to say that when it comes to working with faculty, um, so I, I, I wasn't sure audience-wise here. I did kind of ask before, like, what is this audience? Is it administrators? Is it faculty? And I learned it was both. I might be talking more to, I don't know who here, administrators. So if you're faculty, maybe you can, I don't know. We're going to be talking about you a little bit. 
Um, what I've what I've learned is that faculty, um, and actually this is true for anybody. I mean, you can only do so much. You only have so much time and energy. And so when you want change to happen, you have to make that change as incremental and easy as you possibly can. And so I have to say that I definitely believe that open is both the importance, the free and the 5R permissions are critical and they will innovate and revolutionize education. I have no doubt about that. When it comes to talking with faculty, the easy in is talking about affordability and talking about free. So I'm going to tell you that that's a strategy. It's, it's um, if we can get them to, to, to buy that, that that's important. The five R's are like kind of, kind of icing on the cake. Or icing on the birthday cake, I should say. Right? <laughs> so, so that's the approach that we took, um, is talking about affordability. So we'd show them information like this. So this is the US higher education funding. The green line there is state funding. This is average across all 50 US states. The orange line there is tuition revenue. And so you can see in 1988, look at the, look at the percentage of, of the, the cost per FTE that was on the backs of students and how much the state paid for. And then look at where we're at today. It's a very different picture from back when I was in school. Here's Georgia, by the way. Here's the last 10 years. And I'll be honest with you, this isn't bad. Minnesota looks much worse. The lines have crossed. Okay? So um, I, I should say, you know, to, you know, students can pay for, uh, it, it, students can either, either have funding, they have to work, if they're going to do this, they either have to have the money from their parents, from wherever, they have to work at it, or they need to borrow it, right? Those are really the three ways of getting it. I suppose they could steal it, but I won't cover that one. Um, if they work for it, um, it's also, it looks very different than from long ago. So here's a graph, here's a, a graph I made of, basically, um, what it shows is the number of hours a student at the University of Minnesota, because that's the data I used, the number of hours at minimum wage they would have to work to afford one year of tuition. So if you look down in 19, oh my cheaters on here, but what is that, 1960? About 200 hours. That's a pretty good summer job. Right? At minimum wage, they could afford tuition. Now this doesn't even talk, this doesn't talk about living expenses or anything else, books for sure. And today, it's basically, if you're getting up to 1,700 hours, um, we're talking 40 weeks of 40 hours a week. We're talking almost full-time job at this rate, at minimum wage. So the point being, it's a very different place for your students than it was for us. And then I'll also show faculty this, which is the debt. Here, again, they can work, they can borrow. Here's what the borrowing looks like. The green line is credit card debt nationally. The orange line is student loan debt. And this is just crazy. If you look at 2006, eight, eight years ago only, it was at half a trillion dollars, and now we're at about 1.3 trillion dollars in eight years. I, I don't understand that. So anyway, that we'll 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 show faculty that, and it, it just to help them understand that there there's something they can do. There's something they can do to help. They can't impact tuition. They can't impact living expenses, but they can impact textbooks and the course materials they choose. And so, so when we talk about textbooks, the other thing that we found is that faculty um, are very sensitive, of course, as they should be, uh, thankfully they are, to the academic impact of these costs. So it's not just the money, but it's the impact it has in this, with the students in their courses that they care about. And so what we tell them is, basically, here are ways, here are strategies that students use to try to get by with the affordance issue with textbooks, right? They purchase an older edition of the textbook. They delay buying it as long as possible, if at all. Oftentimes they don't, okay? So, is this, 
good point, right? I think he's probably right. Uh, this is a student who basically who said, um, he said, he was asked to buy an $80 French textbook. He found one on somewhere, uh, uh, eBay or something. That was $8, but it was two editions older. And this is actually pretty good reasoning, I think. Uh, but you all know that what he's doing is putting his academic success at risk, right? Because things do change with textbooks, assignments and readings and so forth. He is putting himself at risk. He knew it, but he thought, okay, I think I can get by with this. So, so it's, it's, it's something that, that he was felt that he needed to do financially. Um, this, is from a, this is from a survey of, um, of students in our, our Minsky system, our, which is the other, we have two systems in the state. And we found this as I've traveled around here, um, as I, when I go to campuses that have high kind of military student presence, I'm hearing the same exact thing about the GI Bill and the paperwork that's needed to be done for that. There are places that are telling, yeah, we, yeah, 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 we can get around that. The bookstore can, if they know they have financial aid, they'll kind of float them alone or they'll do. But generally, kind of, this is at least the perception students have. I don't have the money. I can't buy the book yet. I have to wait. And you heard uh, David talk about this morning. It's usually after, it's after the drop date because they want to make sure you're still in the course before they give you that financial aid. Then you have the money. So that leaves you about three or four weeks of time where you may not, students may not have the course materials. This is something that resonates with faculty because they see it. And there, it, it starts to click about, oh, it, it, and maybe there is something I can do about this. So we'll also show them from the voice of a student. I usually wait until uh, I feel like there's a need in the class to buy the textbook or if I'm falling behind and I can't find another resource for free online that um, would also give me that information and then I'll buy a textbook. I have delayed purchasing a textbook until it was completely necessary to have it. Yes, I have, unfortunately. <laughs> I had some troubles because of it. Textbooks are obviously something that you really obviously need and in order to do well in a class, you know, you need to have that textbook and because it costs so much, I think a lot of people have problems getting the required text and therefore they have struggled in classes they shouldn't necessarily struggle in. So we, I sent a student out one day just and, and he interviewed about eight students on campus. So the answers here are just kind of pulled out of that. But these are things that, again, faculty understand. They get this. And you've seen these numbers, I think, maybe, this may be the third time. Uh, I, I think Cable had these. I think uh, David maybe this morning mentioned them. Um, there isn't anybody he, that should be okay with this. And I spend a lot of time with my faculty helping them use technology in their teaching and so on. Um, I, to be honest, can't think of any technical innovation that can improve this more than the possibility of open. I really can't. So, so these are the kinds of things that, um, that will show faculty. So we ran this workshop. You know, they have this, uh, they have this uh, the, the online library. How many adoptions do you think I have now? Zero. Oh, so after banging my head on the desk for a while, went back and, 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 and realized something that I already knew because I'm faculty as well, is that there are a lot of things faculty are asked to do. This is one of the, how many? I don't even know, right? This isn't, uh, probably not at the top, even after they've learned all that and they get it, that they, are they have the power to make some difference. If they walk away at that point, um, go back to their offices. If, this is what I would do. Go to a workshop. I go back to my office and, oh, my email's here again. Oh, and you get buried in the day and there you go. It's, something, it's, it's on your list of things you'd like to do someday, right? Do we all know that feeling? My list is pretty long. Um, so what I did, and this is a complete accident actually, because what I did is ask my dean, I said, you know, we really need some money to, we're gonna, we, we need some, we need some, um, to put reviews in the online library. I, I need to, just a couple hundred dollars to pay faculty to write some reviews. So let's get going on that and get, some, so we did that. And so these same faculty who went through the workshop and they knew about the library, they did that. They um, wrote some reviews, 
paid them a couple of hundred, you know, a cost of one textbook, two textbooks, two hundred dollars, something like that. And um, and so they actually engaged with a book. And it didn't cost very much money to do that, just a couple hundred dollars. Again, my intent was just to get a review out of it, to say, oh, let's put these in the library. But what we found out was this combination of having this easy place to find things, some little education, some incentive to write a review. In other words, this, we think this is important. We're going to pay a little bit for your time. And what we found is that that led then, that led to 10 faculty here are my adoptions now. Over the, and, and over the last two years, those 10 faculty have saved their students about $270,000. Again, that last piece was an accident, but it was the missing piece. It was, it's just we need to make it easy for them, easy to find, easy to understand quality. Um, we need to give them a little bit of education and understanding of what we're talking about, and then get their attention somehow. And so, and, and $270,000, I mean, is, you've done much more here the faculty in the room that we just recognized um, it doesn't take much I heard over a million dollars you know and it doesn't take a lot these are not there's no large enrollment courses here these are all kind of average 20 to 40 person courses you know I said earlier that I really believe open is the answer but it's, it's more than just free that it's also the openness of it in a way, our strategy is to say, if we can just get it in the door, the open, we'll realize the rest of that stuff later, the five R's. That's what we were hoping. I haven't had a lot of resources to put towards that in my staff, but there were some things that I, happened on their own. We had three faculty who had adopted a, a statistics book. They got together one summer and decided, um, we need to add a chapter. There's something here that's missing for us, because they, they taught one specific tool, I think. And, and so they kind of copy edited the book. They wrote a chapter together, the three of them, kind of split the work up. Um, they wrote a thousand item question bank. They sent all that back to the original author, by the way, too, and said, hey, just you know, here you go, who was thrilled about it and has used it, made the, made it, the book better. There's a math faculty in the math department that adopted an open textbook and then decided he liked the idea so much of kind of sharing that he, he actually created a series of videos to go along with this open textbook and posted it up out there openly licensed for anyone to use. It's at the University of Minnesota. Um, and then actually just a, a week or two ago, I had a meeting with three faculty who had adopted a personal finance open textbook and they were struggling. They were, they were saying, yeah, you know, the stats in this book aren't up to date anymore because there's, there's the consumer price index and there's all these other surveys. And, you know, it's, you're talking about finance. It changes all the time and all the different measures. And we were talking about it. And one of them suddenly said, wait a minute. You know, because the data was out of the book, out, out of date in the book. And they said, well, wait a minute. The consumer price index is on the web. I mean, it's public information. And all of the measures, that they, they kind of went through them. Well, what about this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they actually ended up, they said, oh, what we could do is, so they engaged in a discussion about instruction, changing their instruction. And they moved from having students read a chapter about consumer price index and all these measures to saying, let's give them a project to do. Let's have them go deal with the primary data source. And then something. They, they didn't come to an, but they got very excited about it. They said, we're just going to cut that chapter out of this open book about consumer price. That's fine. We don't need that anymore. We're going to go do primary source uh, research with our undergrad students. So that took, um, as an administrator, that took nothing. I didn't, it wasn't me. It was them knowing what open was. They knew. They had gone through all this. They had some understanding and knowing what they could do with it. It opened up all these new doors. So what I'd like to do, um, as I've traveled around, I've been at, in the last eight months, I think I've been to about eight or nine universities running workshops and so on, doing these things. And I want to I tell you, I guess, some of the questions that I hear just about everywhere I go. And um, so they, they, because they might be in your mind as well. 
So these are questions that may come from leadership or administration as I'm on campus. And they're both questions and they're also opportunities that I always want them to know about, about open. I get asked this one all the time. I would say this is the first question people who really don't know anything about open ask. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this one a little bit later, but um, uh, the answer is um, no, never. In fact, of the 250 something faculty in my college, not the university, the university is like 55,000 students, it's humongous, <laughs> but in my college of 250 faculty, and I know almost all of them, I know one faculty member who actually makes any kind of significant money at it. And he's kind of like, yeah, whatever. I, you know, he's got his book, he's not worried about anything. And if it goes away someday, I'm sure he's, I don't know. But no, never. It's an on issue. Here's a tough one, isn't it? And, and I think we heard this a little bit. I think uh, David might have brought it up. But what about the bookstores and won't cutting our own, won't we just be cutting our own income? Um, the right answer to this one is kind of, it depends, and maybe, and yes. I don't, one of those. Uh, and uh, I heard, you know, we've heard earlier, you know, there might be other opportunities. This may be an opportunity, this may be a window of opportunity for bookstores. I'll tell you that when I started this, I didn't, this project, I didn't tell our bookstore director for a long time. <laughs> and I knew him pretty well. And finally I said, okay, Bob, come here. All right, I'm gonna meet with you. Here's what we're doing. And um, he sat there and listened. And when he was done, he's like, absolutely, how can I support you in this? And I said, well, could you do on-demand printing? Could you do, could, we, could the orders still come through the bookstore? And then I don't, you know, whatever. I mean, we, we kind of brainstormed about it. And afterwards, after the meeting, I kind of said, Bob, you got to tell me, you know, like, I wasn't expecting that reaction. And he said, he said, well, he said, we're self-sustaining, as most, if you have a campus bookstores, they're generally self-sustaining entities. And he said, I, I, I can go to the president and tell him we're in the red someday, if that's the case, you know. But he said, if I stop meeting the needs of faculty and students, I'll be done, done long before then. And so, you know, he understood, he understood his role, the role of a bookstore and the mission of a university. And um, he, he, after that, was probably the biggest advocate I had. He'd sit at meetings with vice provosts and say, here's how many books were raised, textbooks cost, you know, went up by, this publisher raised all their books by 17% this year. This one was, uh, here's how many books we have that are over $300 now, and so on. Just to, you know, he, he's seen as a trusted source in that kind of data. So I, my answer to this is I don't really know. It depends on the campus. And what I always say is if it's a concern, then you as a campus should have a conversation about what your priorities are. I, we can't answer that one. Uh, here's one I've never talked about before. Uh, I, so when Justin, my son, when we brought him up to Duluth, um, we had a parent orientation, and so we sat in a big auto, kind of auditorium of parents, and there were some students down on the stage answering questions. And um, it went, was going really well, and there were all sorts of very interesting questions, the kinds that you might expect, you know, how's the food? What's it like living in the dorm room? Can you do this? Can you do that? And is, is it safe? And is it this? And the students were all very honest, as students will be. Uh, they have no agenda here. And so they're kind of saying, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's cafeteria food, but, you know, it's fine. It's good. You know, I like, I like this, and I like that, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, but it's good, you know, and everyone's nodding, and okay, okay. And then someone asked, started asking about textbooks. And my wife, and, and this conversation of textbooks went on for like 10 minutes. My wife leaned over to me and said, wow, did you notice how the tone in the room just went, Phew. and it did. There was anger in the room. There was, there, were, there was a student who said, yeah, my faculty member who wrote this textbook made us buy it. Oh, I mean, again, I think that's relatively rare, but that's, that's, that's the narrative that kind of that the public, that our parents have about these things. And, 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 and that wasn't the only one. I mean, every question about textbooks was like, oh, are you kidding me? A $200 what? for a book, and, and is there any way around that, and can we, 
And, and it was rather interesting. Every, and then kind of we went on to something else and the tone kind of popped back up again of the whole thing. And so, again, I, this section here was about administrators and things you might want to be thinking about. Do we care about what, what our, both our, not only our students, but the, maybe the people paying for our students to come to the, our institutions care about? Our public. In some ways, I think what was being represented there was this, I could see parents just Mm, like, like this is a breach of tr public trust in some ways. Are you kidding me? So I just want to throw that out there. It was a very, very interesting conversation. I think they're really valuable, but the cost is just a little, little too much for students who are always already paying a lot for tuition. Find a way to make costs more manageable because tuition is going up, everything's going up cost of living is going up and then textbooks are going up. There is definitely a value to them, but maybe not for the cost that we pay for them. I mean, I guess professors are trying to uh, provide students with books that are reasonable, but I mean, there are some textbooks that are just, um, they're just way too pricey. I just feel like they're really overpriced, yeah. I get frustrated when a, uh, you have to buy a book that's expensive that you don't use. Textbooks are only used for so long before you're done with them. So it's like, you know, use it for a couple months and then probably never touch it again. If people weren't just um, issuing new editions and just increasing prices, rather stick to what you have. It is kind of expensive. And sometimes I feel like I have to buy the textbook because um, it is required. But it does kind of suck to like throw away so much money on something that you only use for a semester. They, they should keep the same textbook for several years because the material doesn't change that much. I have purchased them and I don't use them, which is kind of frustrating. I think it's outrageous, actually. Um, yeah, they cost way too much in general, I think. Uh, it is just, just to point out that that is the ongoing narrative on uh, it, it is a value judgment question it isn't I didn't hear any anybody there say what a waste of that these aren't valuable things in fact they were rather kind of yeah I get it they're important but the value or the cost is there and it's a very reasonable thing I think a student's perspective on it and and so if there's an opportunity again to change that narrative on campus, all of those all of those issues would go away if cost went away, right? Then it's all value from there. Here's another opportunity, something that I think the leadership of the University of Minnesota is starting to realize, and that our funding from the state is going. And here's the same graph I had before. The same the the funding from the state is going down, and we also have a tuition freeze. We have had for the last two years, and it's going to continue. Uh, for good reason, right? I mean, we, we know why that is. We're trying to keep costs down for students. So as, an, as a higher level administrator, you kind of, you know, responsible for funding programs, you get kind of stuck in the middle of that. Your funding is going, you know, your funding sources are, are dwindling. This is an excellent, excellent opportunity, really. Open textbooks is an open, excellent opportunity to reduce the cost of attendance without touching budgets at all. Right? You can make it cheaper for students to go to your institution without, again, any kind of, you're not sacrificing any kind of, any programs, and you're not raising taxes. You're not you're having to go to the legislature to ask for more. It's a, it's a nice place to be, and there are very few, if any, kind of other issues that cuts through, cut through that. The other thing I'd like to say to administrators is this. This comes from the, the, the Babson report, which came out, I don't know, a month ago maybe, and some conclusions that they came up, they did a, a nationwide survey on, on, on open education. Here are some, some things they came up with, and I believe this is absolutely true from my experience. You know, I get questions asked like, are these faculty objecting to this? Are these, you know, the publishers? No. Like, there's, there's like nobody like fighting this right now. So don't be afraid, in a way. Dive into this. And the same thing goes with faculty. I have found this to be true with them. If, if you approach it in a reasonable, careful way, yeah, they actually kind of relate to the idea. They're there to share knowledge, right? So again, this should give you some courage to kind of go ahead and, and try some things. This is one that I get, that I got, the very first question that I got asked when I started shopping this idea around three years ago to, to, to deans and, you know, are they any good? 
What's the right answer to that one? My, my answer is usually, I have no idea. And it is, I'm not qualified to judge that. You are. You, faculty, you need to judge that yourself. And I think we're finding that, that, I'll, that they are pretty good quality. I'll show you what we're learning about that. But um, I learned very quickly, and in the wrong, in a, uh, in a, not in a great way, uh, that trying to make a judgment, me as an administrator saying, hey, these are great, um, is not a good move. Because I am not, again, I'm not qualified to make that judgment. So, but the easy answer is, yeah, I don't know. I could really use your help figuring that out, right? So one thing that we, again, in this catalog, that we've tried to, we're starting to collect reviews. We've got a, a, just about 100 collected now. Um, we're seeing this. This is on a scale of one to five. These are how faculty are rating the textbooks. Pretty good, I'd say. There also are more actual kind of textual reviews in the, in the catalog, so you can go in there and, and read comments about 10 different points um, uh, uh, that, they, that they measure these on. So, also want to point out that this is becoming an increasingly easy thing to talk about because it is becoming more main, mainstream. Here's the traffic on that library site. It's starting to shoot up. Here's common questions I get from faculty. The same question about quality. Here's the same question that's really about quality. Here's the same question really about quality. Right? That is their number one concern. And if we just tell them that we trust them to make that decision, in fact, that is their responsibility. That's what academic freedom is. It's their responsibility, their right, and their responsibility to make those judgments. This one I do. David talked about this a little bit this morning about, you know, if it's free, how can it be any good? And I hear that one all the, all the time. And I usually kind of say, well, do you walk into your library, look around and go, this stuff's free, where's the good stuff? <laughs> um, likely not. And Meryl, I'm sure you can, you can vouch for the fact it's not free. But the point is, it's free to the end user, and that's the important thing, right? It, there's access to everyone for that. Won't take a lot to, to more work to adopt an open textbook. You hear that a lot. It's going to take a lot of work for me. Actually, to just adopt it, to make that minor, I forget how David phrased it, the delta, to, to just, no, not really. It's just a, it's a textbook. If, if that's all you're doing, is switching to an open textbook, it's just like adopting any open textbook. Is it work? Yep, you know it is if you've done it before. But that's what we're here for, right? Um, I would say that it, once, once you start getting to it, adapting it and doing more work with it and editing it and doing all of that, yes, it certainly is. The payout back is worth it. But I would say f to faculty, and I don't think you're going to have a problem here in Georgia, but I would say that if you're finding yourself feeling like it's too much, seek out some help. You've got lots of it here. In closing here, I want to show you, I just want to quickly tell you what we've been doing. These are the institutions, is this all of them? I think so, that we've kind of traveled to run this program this year, and, um, and there are now th kind of thriving, and there's, and some of the institutions there already were, but and some there weren't at all, thriving kind of open uh, textbook programs. And some of them just wanted to bring in an outside person, because you know how that works, right? Um, you might have a lot of expertise locally, but you know, would they ask me to keynote at the University of Minnesota? No, probably not. <laughs> but I've done it a lot of other places. Um, this is where we'll be in the spring, Ohio State, Virginia Tech, and our Minsky system, which is actually 31 campuses in, in Minnesota, will be running some. Um, the University of North Dakota is awaiting some funding. Um, this is one we're in discussion with, the CIC, which is the Big Ten institutions, plus the University of Chicago. Um, all big research institutions, and um, they're moving in that direction. And what we recently decided to do, and this hasn't launched yet, so you're privy to this top secret information, is launch an actual, a new thing. A new thing we're calling the Open Textbook Network. And it's these institutions that have had this kind of, this common experience, they have these programs running, and they started talking about how do we, what next? How do we support each other? Why? Can we get some faculty champions to tr talk to each other? Can we get that? And, and so that will be launching here 
in the next few months this spring. Um, I'm going to run through these really quickly. Am I getting the eye yet? Okay, I have the eye. So uh, it, of the, the faculty who come to our workshop, 37% um, of them ended up eventually adopting an open textbook. Um, it isn't, there isn't necessarily anything magical. Um, one key is getting the right people in the room. But um, it's, it's worked pretty well. I'm going to skip over that. Um, and the last thing we're going to do as an open textbook network, this is, the, this is what we're doing with, with institutions. We have the library, we have the workshop, we have the reviews, and we're also then collecting data from the faculty about their adoptions and the savings, and we're pushing that back to them so that um, it's useful to them to talk to their own leadership and to brag about the good things that they're doing. So in conclusion, I just want to kind of say that that I, again, very on the ground look, but I hope what it's given you is some hope that there are ways forward, either as an administrator, as a faculty member. There, there, aren't, a lot of, there aren't a lot of barriers in the way, and especially here with the support that you have. Um, you, can, you can do this and take small steps uh, and make it work for your students. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, so, so for the first year, for those first institutions, those first eight that I showed, um, the Hewlett Foundation actually funded the payment of those. All the other institutions moving forward have decided to do that themselves. They've decided to self-fund the program. And so we'll come around the workshop, and then we'll do all the work of, of collecting the reviews. The institutions are, are paying those. It's not a lot of money. Again, two hundred dollars a faculty member. So, so absolutely, we'll take re and the reviews then also, of course, benefit the library. So we'll take them certainly, of course. Yep. Um, so, Dave, I just want to uh, recognize the the uh, remarkable work that you've done. I don't think that um, I could have imagined this when we had that conversation three years ago. So. Um, it's it's really uh, uh, great to to see how far you've come. Although I should probably set the record straight that he didn't actually come to the session that I gave at that conference. Um, he skipped that, so you probably gave me a little bit too much credit there. Um, but anyway, so um, you talked about working with faculty and administrators, and I know that we have a lot of librarians in the room. Um, and it's been really great to see how you've worked with your library at the U and, and also at libraries at the campuses you visited. So uh, I was wondering if you could say a few words for uh, how libraries can be engaged in this. I think libraries are at the center of this. And at most institutions, I get invited by libraries. Uh, when we first created this online library, our own University of Minnesota libraries, I, I went to them and said, this is a catalog, your librarians, please help. And, and they kind of said, well, we don't really get involved in course materials. But I would say very quickly, the whole, sh the, the whole atmosphere, the whole c nationwide shifted with libraries, where they, I think, are seeing themselves more as this is a, we are the trusted place in the institution for content. Librarians have it, I think, in their core being this desire to share knowledge. And so I can't think of a better part, but I, I'm, I, I, they now run the online library, and they're renovating it. And I have a partner that travels with me, a librarian who runs works. I'll do the faculty workshops. She'll go off with librarians and other staff and talk to them about these issues and say, hey, this is what your faculty are going to be told. And so we want to make it more sustainable on each campus. And they're the ones, the librarians, who are, who are it. I think they're the ones carrying this flame, for sure. Yeah. 